Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Uh, Guernsey is a beautiful and magical place. You're very lucky. But, you know, I did my history before coming, and I've re I realized that Guernsey's been through some tough times, whether it be pirate raids during the Middle Ages or occupation during World War II. And if you extrapolate that across islands globally, you'll see the historical trend that, for a large part, islands have gotten a bad hand. But my talk today is about how islands are flipping the script. Islands have been determined as victims of colonization, occupation, and um, now climate change. But now they are flipping that script and actually providing the solutions to the world's most difficult challenges, how to combat climate change. And they are doing that by demonstrating that an economy can go from a, a fuel that is dirty, unhealthy, unreliable, makes you more dependent in fossil fuels, to a new and modern fuel that is healthy, safe, and independent. And in the process, islands are the ones that are providing the bold solutions to the, to, to the world's problems. We all know that islands are highly vulnerable to climate change. They're vulnerable to natural disasters, rising sea levels, coastal erosion. Some islands like this one are facing an existential threat to climate change, where the world that they have today will look very different tomorrow. And every part of their life is in danger. I lived on this island for three years. It's called Tabatwe Meyaki. It's in the southern Gilbert Islands in the Republic of Caribous. It measures just over one meter above sea level. As you can see here, a much younger, thinner version of myself quickly became part of the family. And since then, I have dedicated my life to helping island countries across the world adapt to the impacts of climate change. And through that experience, I've had several conversations with people in islands. And I cannot tell you how disempowering the narrative is around islands as victims. But again, they are now flipping that switch. And they today are making the new solutions for tomorrow. And islands are developing blueprints for how a global energy transition will happen tomorrow. So how are they doing this? Well, at my organization, the Rocky Mountain Institute and Carbon War Room, we are working with over 10, 10 island countries in the Caribbean and, and taking them through a step-by-step -step concerted process that we call the playbook that we jointly de uh, developed with uh, the U.S. Department of Energy. The playbook is a six-step simple process that is tailored to the local context. It starts with setting a vision then moving into characterizing the energy system in order to identify the optimal projects, then moving to prepare those projects and de-risk them for market, implementing those projects, and then doing operations and maintenance, then moving uh, into process improvement. And by doing this, islands have found themselves, whether they like it or not, at ground zero for the global energy transition. And it's amazing to see the progress that these islands have made. And they do it, and as we've, as we've gone and through and worked with these countries, we've dealt with a number of different challenges in different size economies. For example, in Montserrat, uh, we're working to redesign and rebuild the energy matrix after a volcano nearly destroyed the entire country over a decade ago. In Colombia, we're working with an indigenous community on the islands of San Andres and Providencia on the coast of Colombia to define an indigenous vision for their energy future. In St. Lucia, we're bridging the divide between uh, investor-owned utility and, a, um, and the government in order to chart out a, a joint pathway forward. 
And in, um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which is a multi-island state where 90% of the population lives on the main island, we are working to modernize and transition the small islets of the Grenadines to high penetration renewable energy. And through this process, we've identified that there's some key ingredients in order to catalyze the energy transition, regardless of the size of the economy. The first starts with a plan. You got to have a plan that brings in all stakeholders. And when I say all stakeholders, the government, the utility, and the public. When you move from a centralized energy supply, where your energy is produced in a room this size, somewhere hidden away that you rarely see, to a decentralized generating system, where renewable energy technologies dot the natural landscape, that becomes a very personal thing in an island. And everyone in an island wants and should have a say in what the world around them looks like. Next, you have to understand the technical parameters of the electrical grid, as well as a detailed understanding of the underlying economics of the energy sector. Together, this will get you buy-in with the rest of the stakeholders and avoid significant pitfalls later in the journey. Next, you must act. It's critical that the early stages in a process of implementing a plan that you get the inertia required in order to give people the confidence that it can be achieved. Now this takes leadership at all levels or else the process will inevitably stall. It also requires taking risks. And I think we all know in islands, populations are normally very conservative. I know we've worked with a number of utilities who were at the, at the first step scared to death of renewable energy because it required building new skills, it required changing the way they do business. Utilities have to change the entire, their entire business model in order to deploy renewables at scale. But with new technologies hitting the market every day, we're seeing governments and utilities alike around the world make concerted steps and progress forward. No more is this more prevalent than battery storage. Battery storage is the game changer for the island energy transition. Because what battery storage does when coupled with intermittent renewable energy supply provides a reliable, readily deployable power. In other words, storage enables the sun to shine when the sun is not shining and the wind to blow when the wind is not blowing. Uh, battery lith lithium ion battery storage has dropped in price over 60% over the last two years. This has made the combination of renewable energy and battery storage much more competitive with traditional fossil fuel generation. And islands is where these technologies are being tested and deployed today. Finally, you must collaborate. In order for energy transition to be successful, you have to work together. No one person can facilitate an energy transition alone. It requires a, a dialogue and an open and learning environment. And collaboration breeds in an environment where Everyone can be open and everyone can learn. At the Rocky Mountain Institute in Carbon War Room, we've done this by creating a virtual platform where utilities, governments, energy practitioners are able to collaborate on their energy transition issues because islands only get one chance at this. They cannot afford to make a mistake. Most islands don't have the capital to make a, make a mistake. So it's critical that they learn from other islands throughout their journey in the process. More importantly, they learn from their mistakes so they don't repeat them. 
And so islands, again, whether they find themselves, whether they like it or not, will provide the blueprint on how an economy transitions from an economic, regulatory, financial, and technical perspective and provide insights into what a global energy transition would look like at scale. And so the world is watching islands right now because the insights gleaned today will provide the catalyst for a global energy transition tomorrow. And I'll leave you with this one last point. This is a, a point that uh, the founder of Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, Amory Lovins, likes to end with. We have an, exactly enough time to realize a, a local and global energy transition starting right now. Thank you.